This morning's Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will put the sheep at His right hand, and the goats at His left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it, to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Here ends the Gospel reading for today. Good morning. It's been an exciting week for our church. 
Last Sunday afternoon, we finally held a confirmation service for seven young people who are now of an age as young adults to confirm the promises made on their behalf at their baptism, to confirm for themselves their desire to follow the teachings of Jesus and hopefully to play a full and enthusiastic part in the life of our church. Of course, if you told me a year ago that their confirmation service would take place outside on the grass with families socially distanced and the confirmands wearing masks, I wouldn't have believed you. And if you told me many years ago when I was confirmed that one day we would conduct confirmation classes from our homes while we all looked at each other's faces on a screen, I would have dismissed it as pure science fiction. But one thing this pandemic has taught us is that human beings are endlessly creative. So congratulations to Sam, Elliot, Ali, Ethan, Morgan, Mitchell and Anna, who have learned a lot. They've learned not only about church history, the sacraments, and the Pastor Van Orden technique for opening a Bible in the middle and from there finding exactly the chapter and verse that you want. Clever hint there, Pastor. But they spent time doing service projects, making craft gifts, creating Easter baskets for those who were homebound, and during the pandemic being pen pals with seniors who were at home. And hopefully they began to discover something of the joy that can come from serving others. And that's an appropriate thought for today, which is Christ the King Sunday, a celebration recognized by most Catholic and Protestant churches around the world. There are some denominations who don't recognize this day. Of course, they recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as a great teacher, but they hesitate to call him mighty Lord and King of all, especially in countries where they have known cruel leaders who seek only power and dominance. But Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 that being a leader isn't about power, but about service. He said, you know, there are some who are recognized as rulers who lord it over the people and make their authority over them felt, but it should not be among you. Rather, whoever wishes to become great among you will be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you will be servant of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's a hymn that we sing sometimes called The Servant King. This is our God, the Servant King. And the servant king is not an oxymoron. We have a phrase in England where I was born. It's adapted from the French, noblesse oblige. And it means the more noble you are, the more responsibility you have for others. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And that's a good message for our confirmands and for all of us on this Christ the King Sunday. When we talk about human beings and our behavior, some people say that human beings are either dog lovers or cat lovers. <laughs> Incidentally, do you know the difference between a dog and a cat? A dog looks at you with those big brown eyes, cocks its head to one side and says to itself, you love me, you feed me, you care for me, you take me for walks, you must be God. A cat looks at you with those wide eyes and thinks to itself, you love me, you feed me, you care for me, you pet me, I must be God. <laughs> there are cat people and there are dog people. There are tennis people and there are golf people. Some people like to sleep with the windows open and other people prefer to sleep with the windows closed. Hopefully they're not married to each other. There are Tigger people, and there are Eeyore people. There are Shoprite shoppers, and there are Wegman shoppers. There are people who make breakfast, and people who stop at the Wawa. 
But if you read this morning's gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 25, Jesus seems to be saying that ultimately there are only two kinds of people, sheep and goats. Which are you? Which am I? This is one of those passages which, if you take it literally, leads to the myth that there are good people and bad people, and the good people go to heaven and the bad people burn in hell. This thinking was especially prevalent in the Middle Ages. If you've ever seen a performance of the medieval mystery plays, these were performed by the ancient trade guilds in England in and around churches on public holidays or holy days, you will see audience participation at its most embarrassing. The actors would grab people from the crowd to play the role of goats or sinners, and they were bundled into a gaping hole with flames painted all around it and thrown into hell. Well, their friends had a good laugh at their expense. Well, those people chosen as sheep or good people were driven off on a farm cart to heaven with actors dressed as angels playing harps. Even today, I think Christians are often criticized for thinking of themselves as good people, holier than thou, better than anybody else. But actually, Christians believe quite the opposite. We believe we're all sinners because we believe in human nature. All of us, if left to our own devices, would instinctively do whatever is in our own best interests. But you see, we also believe in repentance and forgiveness. Forgiveness is what we ask for at the beginning of every service every week. So why should we put others first if it's not to make sure we get into heaven or to win some kind of earthly reward? As Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by doing good works, so no one can boast. So why then should we put others first? It's because how we treat others reveals the state of our relationship to Jesus. Look at today's Gospel reading. He said, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And they said, When were you hungry, and we fed you? When were you a stranger, and we invited you in? When were you naked, and we clothed you? And Jesus said, Whatever you did for the least of my people, you did it for me. By serving others, we are serving Jesus. And with that, we discover the joy that comes with using our own particular gifts in the service of others. When I was in high school, I spent a lot of time in the headmaster's office. Not because I was a sheep, but because he seemed to think I was a goat. He couldn't understand why somebody with such a high IQ was unable to remember which classroom he was supposed to be in, and why my homework essays seemed to be on a completely different topic than the one set by the teacher. I explained that I thought she'd be bored reading 30 essays all the same, so I thought I'd give her something different. That didn't go down very well. He also pointed out that my examination failures might make it hard for me to be accepted by any college or university. I said that was only because exams always ask the wrong questions. But I was saved by the arrival of a letter. It wasn't like Harry Potter. It didn't arrive by owl. It came by mail. But it seemed just as magical to me. And I still have the letter now. It was from the new College of Speech and Drama, England's most prestigious arts college asking me if I might drop by for an interview. The new college was probably the smallest college in the world. They admitted only around 40 students per year, so there were only about 120 students in the entire college. Each student had been hand-picked 
not for their academic qualifications, fortunately for me, but for their potential to be creative and inventive people. This unusual college was based at Ivy House, a beautiful old English country house that had previously been the home of ballerina Anna Pavlova. Situated on Hampstead Heath on the outskirts of London, surrounded by woods and heath, a deer park, and a lake where Anna Pavlova had devised her legendary dance, The Swan. Our rehearsal room was Pavlova's studio, with her original full-length mirror and practice bar. The teachers were all experts in their fields of drama, literature, music, dance, art and design, and broadcasting, and all of them were totally eccentric. I sometimes think Joanne Rowling must have based Hogwarts on our school. <laughs> I could write books about some of these people, and actually people have. But just one example, Helen Spanky, ostensibly the theatre wardrobe mistress, but somebody who knew everything about human behaviour, clothes, customs and history. You could mention any year, say 1685, and she could instantly tell you exactly what people were wearing, their accessories, what they ate, their furniture and architecture. Amazing woman. She had a little dog called Feste, named after Shakespeare's clown, and Feste came to college with her every day. And believe me, this little dog was a clown. He was always rolling over and pulling faces and greatly amused us with his antics. But there's another person I want to mention. You may know that Reader's Digest has a column called My Most Unforgettable Character. Well, if they ever ask me to contribute an article, I would write about Klaus Newberg, our principal teacher, or as you would call him, the president of our college. Klaus Newberg was German and Jewish. He had survived the Holocaust, but had endured difficult times, including seeing members of his family killed. He came to England, and he could have been bitter or angry, but instead decided what the world needed most now was kindness and care. Klaus became an award-winning teacher and writer, and eventually the leader of this unique and eccentric college focused on training people to change lives through the arts. Sometimes students would arrive in London with nowhere to live, and Klaus would simply take them back to his house to stay. If students ran out of cash, Klaus had been known to quietly lend them money. He was once asked whether he thought he'd ever get it back, and he said, when you have seen the horrors I have seen, Money ceases to have so much importance. Klaus was a remarkable man. He seldom wore a suit and tie. He usually wore big woolly sweaters that his wife had knitted for him. And when he was teaching, he absentmindedly pulled the end of the wool and carried on with this fiddling as he taught. And by the end of the class, his whole sweater had completely disintegrated. <laughs> Young children loved him. Children can recognize a kindred spirit. As soon as they came into the room, they would climb up onto his lap and wait for him to tell them a story. One morning, Helen came running into Ivy House in floods of tears. She was hysterical, and we noticed that her little dog, Feste, wasn't with her. Between sobs, she managed to tell us that she was walking over the heath. Feste had chased a squirrel and she'd run after him but she'd lost him and she spent hours walking around the heath calling his name trying to find him klaus immediately cancelled all classes for the day and we all went out into the woods to search for Festy, who was eventually found unharmed i heard later that klaus had received criticism from someone at the department of education for cancelling classes when you close down a college, the students aren't learning anything. Oh no, said Klaus. The students learned something very important. They liked and respected their teacher. 
They knew she lived alone. That little dog was her only companion. To her, he was her family. The students had shown love, compassion, and empathy. And in Klaus's mind, that was the most important lesson of all. Klaus Newberg, my most unforgettable character. That story was for the dog people, so let's finish with one for the cat people. There is a charming children's book you may have seen called All the Cats in the World. We used to have a copy of it up in the Sunday school room. Maybe we still do. It's about a woman who lived near the shore and one day she found some homeless cats living in the rocks near the beach and although she was poor, she managed to save some scraps to feed them. And she would feed them every day. And a fisherman on the beach laughed at her every day saying, why do you bother with those scrawny cats? And she would reply, because they're hungry. And every day he would call out, you can't feed all the cats in the world. And she would reply, but I can feed all the cats in my world. One day she was sick and she was in bed for several days and she was worried all the time. How will my cat survive? Finally, she felt better. Even though she was still weak, she managed to stagger down to the beach where she saw the fisherman who had made fun of her and he was feeding the cats. It's a lovely book and the illustrations are beautifully done too. I recommend it if you have children or grandchildren, all the cats in the world. It has a great message. It's saying, I think, we can't change the whole world, but we can change our part of it. But then something remarkable happens. All the little acts of kindness add up to a whole world of love. Thank you.